So we, we, want to, we, want to, we want to know how many of these species are just exclusive of the region we are analyzing. So we can have our flags tattooed in, close to our hearts. We call, we call those species endemic, or those taxa endemic. Endemism is one of the most ambiguous terms in biodiversity science because it means almost everything. Endemic is a taxon which is only found in a given region or location and nowhere else in the world. We have endemics of the fine bows. We have endemics of South Africa. We have endemics of Africa. We have endemics of the old world. And the human race, the human, the species Homo sapiens is endemic of the planet Earth, right? <laughs> so essentially, it is a matter of scale also. Everybody knows, all of you know, that endemism is key for us to understand biodiversity and it's key for us to communicate biodiversity and it's key for us for obtaining funding for studying biodiversity, right? So we can make endemism of whatever we want. Endemism is a term that depends of scale also. And please t take this very in account. Taxa became endemic depending the chunk of the earth that we're working, working with. We have many classifications of the endemic taxa that help us to understand how the distribution of species can change and are different within the region we are analyzing. We have classification that, is, that say something about the history of the taxon. We have paleo and neo-endemics. That means a neo-endemic reflects a species that is exclusive of one region, but is of recent evolutionary origin. While paleoendemics are species that are restricted to a region, but whose evolutionary origin is much older. How old? How young? Who knows? Who knows? You, you, ha you, have, to, you have to go to ancillary data, evolutionary data, to define when you have a paleo or an endemic. We have a classification of endemism that has to deal with the amount of area that the taxon we are analyzing is occupying. And so we have the definitions of endemic, microendemic, quasi-endemics, and semi-endemics. This is getting more complicated, more complex. We will call endemic any taxon that is restricted to the limits of the region we are studying. That's, that's a general endemic. We will call microendemic any taxon that occupies less than half, whatever, a small part of the total area that we are analyzing. We have quasi-endemics that mean that the species or the taxon we are analyzing is more or less restricted to a region, but some part of its distributional area falls outside a little bit. And we have semi-endemics semi that means that we have a species that have different distributional areas during different parts of the year, in different cycles. And they are endemic to one region during one season and to another region to another season. Is that clear? We have an, a, a mixture of terms here speaking about native and endemics. In some of the old literature, endemic is, is equal to native, but it is not. It is not. 
Can you tell the difference between native and endemic? All, all endemics are native? All natives are endemic. No, that that's an introduced species is not an endemic, nor is native. Okay? So native means that the, the distribution of the taxon in the area is due to natural reasons. The reality in the world of biodiversity is that we use geopolitical endemics. That is species or families or whatever taxa restricted to the political boundaries of the world. Ah, I, have I have prepared this one. This is a semi-endemic, okay? Beautiful, my distributions in the old world. This is a quasi-endemic. And this is an endemic. This is a micro-endemic. You buy it? Yes or no? Okay. So no problem. Okay. Now that we have decided what, what are endemics and what are not endemics, we can then compare the patterns of the distribution in terms of numbers of the different of the, of, of the different taxa. This is a comparison among vertebrates on the top or some, some of the mega, mega diverse countries and, and I don't know how to use this and you can easily present a graph like this. This is the total number of species, this is the total number of endemic species. So we can see very easy how endemism is distributed. For example, for Colombia, the very diverse Colombia, that is the country with the most large, with the largest number of, of species, we have this, this amount of endemic vertebrates that is substantially lower than the ones we have in Indonesia. One way to present. This is endemism. Is in, in plants. So when you work with, with endemism in plants, and if you are in Australia or Madagascar, it's easier to map what are not what is not endemic, right? It's amazing the the amount of the proportion of endemic species in some regions. Another way to present the data that is useful for us is just to make a, a, calcul a simple calculation and see what's the proportion of the taxa, of the taxa that are endemic to, to the region. This is a figure for, for Mexico and you see that we can detect easily that even though we have uh, uh, similar numbers in general, in overall number, in overall patterns of species richness. For the taxa, the, am the amount of the proportion of endemism varies a lot. We have a high proportion of endemic amphibians, more than 60, almost 60 percent, high proportion of reptiles, and a low proportion of endemic butterflies. That this has to be, to de this has to be with the intrinsic Characteristics, characteristics of the taxa. Another issue that has to do with, with this pattern that we are still in the, in the job of describing the biological diversity. We, we have also, you, you have also seen some of these graphs. This is a, a species accumulation curve that wants to illustrate that among different taxa, the rate of description and the, rate of, and, and the proportion of knowledge of the total diversity, biological diversity are different. For birds, the curve is almost flat. For insects, we will never end in biological description. 
I, I don't know if you have seen these graphs before. When we uh, were to enter into the 21st century, this group of experts, of world experts, get, got together to make an evaluation of how much of the biological diversity of the world we, is already known for us. And they developed, based on the rate of description of species, they developed three estimators. One, uh, one not so, one, one strict and one more flexible. So this is mathematical estimations to see how much of the species, how much of the species of each taxon ha, are known already. Sorry, eh? I ask you for a little patience. I have to translate in my brain. To see the amount. This is the figure for the bacteria. What, what means here is we know for the year 2000, we know that there were the, we have 4,000 species of bacteria described. Our lower estimator says that at least there are 50,000 species of bacteria. So we know less than 10%. The intermediate estimator says that there are one million species. And the, big, the, the last estimator says that at least three million species, three million, yes, exist of bacteria. So bacteriologists have a lot of work to do. This is the figure for, for plants. We know for the year 2000, to, 20, uh, 2007, no, no, 270,000. I missed that class in my English <laughs> class. And the higher estimator is about half a million species of plants. So plants are pretty well known. What do you think about animals? <coughs> Better or best? Hmm? Well, I think insects are animals, yes. I hope. No, the, the estimation is amazing. This is this is a, re a really neat, a really neat work. But can you imagine that we have in the world 103 million species of animals, and, and we know uh, one million of them. That's hmm? One billion, thirty-two million. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. One, no. One hundred three million. Is that is that a billion? No. No, a billion is one thousand million millions. One, because for us, for us, a billion is a million millions. So. It's for us. So that's the right. So, 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 so who's wrong? Who's wrong? The gringos. The gringos are wrong always. Okay. Just to illustrate that these are the taxa less known, less studied, and with highest diversity. Mites, nematodes, soil, whatever insects or exapods are here, the deep sea, the deep sea communities. That is why we have now these efforts to survey poorly known areas of the world, like the census of marine life, that m many of you are aware of those. They are doing huge expedition and research in very unknown parts of the oceans that cover most of the land. And from time to time, have you ever visited this page, this web page? This web page tells you about where the last expeditions have been made and they have photographs of the new species that appeared in each of the expeditions. So it's a really neat web page. But these are new things, things we have never seen before. Another aspect of the biodiversity study that has to deal with the knowledge of species richness is that we are improving our knowledge, we are improving the technology to detect 
when we have different evolutionary units that we have to call something, units, units of biodiversity. And th th these techniques and these approaches are helping us to, to discover that even among the things that we call the species, we have several evolutionary units that we have to call species. So we have a mixture of new things. Things that are never, have never seen before. Things that have been seen before, but we didn't know that they were different species. Like this is a forest elephant, is that a forest? A different forest than savanna elephant, something like that. I, I was doing my best to have some African examples, sorry. And another aspect of the study of biodiversity is extinction. Extinction is the, is the study of the biodiversity that we are losing. The other approaches speak about the knowledge of biodiversity that is increasing. Extinction is the biodiversity that is losing. It is very important. I, I read this paper several weeks ago. It's a paper developed by some people at the University of California that say that we have had at least five major events of massive extinctions. And massive, massive extinctions mean that due to any event, it's like a comet, uh, whatever, uh, a meteorite, 70% of the diversity of the taxa that they were studying disappeared. That's what they call a ma major uh, uh, massive extinction. And, and they have detected at least five, the Ordovician, the Devonian, the Permian, the Triassic, and the Cretaceous, that is uh, the, most, the most famous recently. However, they point out that we are approaching a new, a new era of mass extinction given the human activities. This, this graph, what is uh, pointing out, is the percentage of, tech, of the species of the taxon that have become extinct and the percentage of the species of the taxon that are under one of the threatened or endangered species list. So it means that in the last 75, 75 years, we have lost 1% of the mammals due to extinction, but we have 22% that is, is so endangered that perhaps will be extinct very soon. And as you can see, some of the taxa are approaching to this line that defines a ma massive extinction. And this is due to human activities. This, all you know this. Get rid of your cats. Why? Because cats that live in the houses that are beautiful and they purr, purr is the word. When they go out of the house, they are killer machines. <laughs> they kill a lot of birds. So please, I hate cats, get rid of the cats, better have, <laughs> have a parrot or whatever. This is like exotic, this, I forget. Okay, th this you know, this just part of the, okay. I, I, I thought it was you. So, okay. Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Well, as you see, this 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 first part is very easy. It's very is very is very clear for everybody. But is it? I have to. I, I wanted to introduce you to different aspects in which you can deal with species riches, richness and endemism. Now I want to tell you a story. All these issues about species richness and endemism rely on the, the correct recognition of the units of biodiversity. 
and uh, I'm, I'm going to get into the realm of systematics and also we'll have, we'll have a, an example with birds. Birds are an excellent example because due to its characteristics of, of being nice, of, of being easy to study, are very well known. So the, my, my example will deal with that. <laughs> 